I'm Juliet Hooker. I'm a professor in the Department of Political Science, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Seeing Beyond the Veil, Racing Key Concepts in Political Theory, which um, is a, an, an effort of many people on campus. Uh, it was conceived in collaboration with my colleague Melvin Rogers um, in political science and a number of people in political science in the Center for the Study of um, Race and Ethnicity, um, uh, and as well as the Pembroke Center have provided immense support in making this possible. And of course, our first day we're here at the Pembroke Center for the Study of Women. And I'll be thanking people um, in much more detail later, but I just want to note that nothing like this happens without tons of effort from lots of folks. Um, so I just want to say a little bit before we begin with our first panel um, about what we are hoping the conference will do. Um, and we began with the following um, premise, which is that for political theorists working on race, the present moment is somewhat paradoxical. On the one hand, we're witnessing the success of avowed white supremacist and xenophobic political projects in the political arena, while on the other hand, scholarship on race in political theory is not only thriving, but is one of the areas producing some of the more exciting critical theoretical interventions in the field. So how does work on race push us to reformulate or abandon established concepts in political theory? And we hope that the participants in this conference, who, many of whom draw on the archive of black political thought to make powerful interventions in how we think about key philosophical concepts such as justice, freedom, democracy, um, et cetera, um, will help us to think through that question because they, in many ways, challenge us to think these concepts anew. And um, we've brought together some of the folks who have been doing this work for a long time, some new and exciting voices, and we think um, this is um, you know, a very exciting group of people to have convened, um, along with the folks here at Brown who are also doing this work to think about how work on race and political theory might be reshaping the field. Um, at dinner last night, a couple of people pointed out that they do not actually consider themselves political theorists. Um, we have, you know, we have adopted them anyway, but obviously we want, you know, the, this is not a, this is not a conversation that's happening only in political theory, but also in many other fields. Um, and in many ways, um, I want to note that this, this question corresponds to a provocation that was actually prompted by Charles Mills's own reflections um, in his recent book, Black Rights, White Wrongs, on the impact of his ongoing project, to borrow um, the felicitous phrasing of his that prompted the title of the panel, um, to occupy liberalism, right? And in evaluating the impact of this, um, of this project in terms of the, of the success of his best-selling The Racial Contract, which appeared in 1997, Mills has a rather pessimistic assessment of the success of the project, observing that the effect of the racial contract on, quote, mainstream political philosophy in general and social contract theory in particular has been close to zero, end quote. Um, while we can debate whether Mills's assessment is accurate, um, it raises questions about the relationship between black political thought and political theory. Are we using black political thought to speak to political theory, or are fundamental concepts in political theory being transformed by the greater attention thinkers and texts in that tradition are receiving? Should this be one of the aims of our collective work? Um, or is this formulation of the question itself a philosophical and political trap? Um, so these are some of the background questions that we hope we can think about over the next two days as we listen to fascinating work by the brilliant folks we're delighted to have been able to convene to think collectively um, in this event. Thank you for coming. <laughs> 
Uh, welcome again, everybody. I'm Sharon Krause from the Political Science Department. I'm delighted to be chairing our first panel, um, Can We Occupy Liberalism? I'm going to introduce our two speakers. They'll each go for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for lots of conversation. Uh, Charles Mills uh, is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at CUNY uh, Grad Center. He's the author of many books, as you know, including The Racial Contract, Blackness Visible, uh, From Class to Race, Contract and Domination, and most recently, Black Rights, White Wrongs. His paper is called Blackening, Blackened Up, White Liberalism. And Chip Turner is Asso Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Washington. Among other things, he's the author of Awakening to Race, Individualism and Social Consciousness in America, is co-editing with Melvin um, the soon-to-be in print uh, African-American Political Thought, A Collected History, uh, and now is working on a book called Existential Democracy, Death and Politics in Walt Whitman. So we'll start with Charles. Okay, so um, just with respect to that last comment that um, Juliet made, I'm happy to report to this audience that recently I was invited to the 50th anniversary of a theory of justice in 2021. So if that's not respectability, I don't know what is. <laughs> so as I approach my retirement, oh, that guy Mills, maybe we'll, get, we'll make a token appearance before he exits into the sunset. <laughs> Okay, so serious, no, I mean, I was actually serious about that. That's actually true, I, I, I was not making that up. So let me begin by thanking the organizers in general, and Juliet Hooker and Melvin Rogers in particular, for inviting me to this important conference. As I don't need to tell anyone in this room, the events of the past few years should have definitively dispelled the widespread delusion, at least among white Americans, that Barack Obama's 2008 election signaled that we had at last become a post-racial society. Race and white supremacy remain enduringly central to the nation, as of course they have always been. And any successful political project to bring about a more egalitarian society, a more perfect union, must begin by acknowledging rather than evading this reality. This has, of course, been the mission of the Afro-modern political tradition from the beginning, both in the United States and elsewhere. Unsurprisingly so, since there could hardly be a greater gulf between Western modernity's pretensions and Western modernity's actuality than that manifest in racial chattel slavery. From Kwabna Ottawa Kuguano to Black Lives Matter, we find an overriding concern with the key questions of how best to theorize racial subordination and the obviously related question, how best to overcome it. Now, as the opening program statement well summarizes, this has inevitably required an engagement with the master's tools, whether through direct adoption, modified adaptation, or outright rejection, whether in black abolitionism, black nationalism and pan-Africanism, black anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, black liberalism and black Marxism, black feminism and black conservatism. So my title, Blackening, Blackened Up, White Liberalism, indicates my own line of argument, that we can and should try to occupy liberalism, bringing to bear on this task key theoretical insights and resources of the Afro-modern tradition. Though it is increasingly coming to, sorry, computer. Though it's increasingly coming under challenge, liberalism is generally recognized to be the most successful political ideology of modernity. And it has, of course, been the dominant political ideology in the United States. So as I point out in um, the one, one, one of the two essays I am, you know, um, so, so, submitted for people to skim over. As I point out in Occupy Liberalism, and as we all know, it has been a very illiberal li liberal theory, a liberalism of exclusion and particularism rather than inclusion and universalism. This has been true not just for race, but for gender and class also. Liberal democracy, a term we now take for granted, would have been seen as close to oxymoronic for the classic liberal theorists, for whom the need for restrictions on the franchise was obvious. Even white women don't get the vote until the 20th century for the most part, hundreds of years after what is normally taken to be the birth of the modern epoch. So liberalism has been both bourgeois and patriarchal, 
a liberalism of class and gender privilege. So the obvious question is, why has this been so? So for those of you who had the time to skim over Occupy Liberalism, you'll have seen that I suggest there are two main kinds of explanation, sorry, two main kinds of answer. An internalist explanation or an externalist explanation. The internalist explanation attributes this exclusionary dynamic to intrinsic features of liberalism itself as an ideology. The grounding assumptions, key concepts, and crucial frameworks are so constructed, it is claimed, that oppression of some subset of the human population, perhaps even the majority of the human population, is inevitable. Liberalism as an ideology would then itself be the classic exemplar of what Audre Lorde indicted as the master's tools. And no reclamation, no positive engagement is possible. An emancipator politics will have to set up its, <coughs> theor <coughs> its theoretical house elsewhere and be anti-liberal in its guiding assumptions. By contrast, the externalist explanation, which is the one I favor, locates the problem in what we could think of as material factors. I did my dissertation on Marxism, but I'm trying to keep it quiet, so every now and then it sort of resurfaces. So the particular social groups were coming to dominance at the time of liberalism's formation in the 18th century in Western Europe, and who have continued to be dominant today. Their particular group interests and their success in carrying out their group political projects. <clears throat> From this perspective, liberalism should be seen as plural rather than singular, as diverse rather than monolithic, and above all, as open rather than closed, lending itself to different possibilities. So the claim of externalist folks, such as myself, would be that we find it hard to recognize these alternatives because our cognitive horizons have been so shaped by the existing dominant forms of liberal theory, but this constriction of the social imaginary is not due to an objective apprehension of liberalism supposedly insuperable limitations, but is a consequence of the hegemonic conceptual grip the ruling group's power exercises over us. Different liberalisms are possible. So within the academy, given its overwhelming whiteness, the best known examples of this revisionist exercise are left social democratic liberalism and feminist li 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 liberalism. Social democratic liberalism, inspired in part by the Marxist critique, argues that unconstrained capitalist class domination is inconsistent with liberalism's pretensions to safeguard an individual freedom and that curbs on the power of capital are necessary for the material realization of this promise. Feminist liberalism argues that the continuing caste inferiority of white women is inconsistent with liberalism's pretensions of rejecting the ascriptive hierarchies of the pre-modern social order, and that the achievement of genuine equality requires elimination of male domination. So in both cases, the product of retrieving liberalism requires a remapping of the topography of the polity, a revisioning of the official social epistemology, and a rethinking of the social ontology. Above all, the central normative issue is shifted from the question of our political obligation to the state to the question of social justice, whether in its more restricted incarnation as class justice or as including gender justice. So what I'm now suggesting is that we need to see Afro-modern political thought in at least some of its strains as raising a parallel challenge. I'm not, of course, claiming that everybody under this broad umbrella can be categorized as a liberal, and certainly not that they necessarily thought of themselves as such. As the British political theorist Duncan Bell has pointed out in an important recent article in political theory, liberal has very much become a term of art, used retrospectively and in a sense anachronistically to characterize people by virtue of their location in what we are now, after the fact, constructing as a coherent, several hundred years old political tradition. So I am in effect invoking these relaxed norms and saying that by these criteria, we can reconstruct a long tradition of Afro-modern liberalism 
black liberalism that is radically different from the mainstream one, and which is in fact oriented in significant measure by the imperative of critiquing. From this perspective, the problem with liberalism has never been its putative abstractness, but its concrete shaping by white racial domination. It is not at all that what we are now calling classical liberalism ignored race, but that for the most part, it took white racial superiority for granted, thereby being what I have been calling in my work a racial liberalism, or the political theorist Jennifer Pitts calls an imperial li 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 liberalism, so that the metaphor I've used of blackening up from the racist American tradition of the minstrel show serves as a metaphor here in that white liberalism is predicated on racist representations of blacks and more generally people of color, so it is already racialized. And the black liberal critique is not trying to introduce race into non-racial discourse, but urging that we recognize the multiple ways in which that discourse is already a racial one, and prescribing accordingly a reconstruction of liberalism on a foundation of racial equality rather than racial hierarchy. So blackening means rejection of blackened up, i.e. the purging of racist frameworks and assumptions from existing dominant liberal theory, whether overt or covert, and the reimagining of liberalism's mapping of the polity, its social epistemology, and its social ontology. So what would this come to in practice? Well, to begin with, I'm suggesting it would require the acknowledgement of the white supremacist nature of the polities created by Western modernity, not just in the United States, but far more broadly. Liberal democracy, to the extent that it has been promoted as a description in these countries, is at best aspirational. The reality has been, in the phrase of Pierre van den Berg, Herrenvog democracy. As David Theo Goldberg argued in a more than a decade ago in his book, The Racial State, the modern state in general is a racial state. And in fact, um, Michael's presentation later on, and recent interesting work in classical um, studies, in medieval studies, is making a case that the racial state goes back to antiquity, and that um, there, there's a book I've read that I've ordered on Amazon, a woman called Geraldine Heng, argues uh, that the first racial state um, she thinks it's um, really, really in, in the medieval period, in the classical period, but she argues for the British state in the 11th, 12th century as being a racial state vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish population there. So it means that part of what you'd be doing in this you know, um, reconstructed Afro-modern tradition and the sort of liberal you know, section of it is to say societies calling themselves liberal dem democratic in the modern period have really been racial states, and as such, it means that there's been a huge gap between their self-conception and their actual sort of, you know, sort of reality in terms of all the things I, I mentioned before. So the example I use, um, not, not, not um, in the two papers I sort of showed them to you guys, but in a recent long essay I did for the um, University of Kentucky Press Political Companion series. So this year, there was one appeared both on W.B. Du Bois and um, Neil here edited one on Frederick Douglass. And I made a case in my essay in the Du Bois collection, though this might seem outrageous, for Du Bois as a black radical liberal. So that's a term I've been using, that you can have a liberalism that incorporates the crucial radical insights of the black tradition, whether from the black nationalist and pan-African Pan-Africanist traditions, black feminist traditions, appropriation of you know, Marxism by the black tradition, and you can nonetheless do that within a radically modified liberal framework. In the case of Du Bois, I, I uh, make a case for his intervention in four crucial areas. First of all, the social ontology of liberalism, standardly, you know, um, we sort of had it represented to us, is an ontology of abstract atomic individuals. And that's quite false, because to begin with, even within the mainstream tradition, if you think of Locke, Locke's individuals are actually already social. So before you have the creation of the state in Locke, you have individuals as in, a, in social relations, so, so extensive, in fact, that you, know, you have you have money, you have trade, you have all kinds of stuff. So even in Locke, a mainstream guy like Locke, 
in the tradition of liberalism inspired by Hegel, T.H. Green, the British Hegelians. This is made even more explicit, and the liberalism you have is one in which individuals are very much shaped by social memberships, by community, and so forth. So liberalism, sort of atomic individualist representation, really represents just one strand of liberalism. And there's no inconsistency, as we've seen in, in um, a more 20th century reference, an American reference, John Dewey. There's no inconsistency in talking about a liberalism that is social, which, rep which sort of realizes the extent to which it's sort of shaped by social forces. So the specifically black input into this then, as I say, using um, Du Bois as sort of key representative, is to argue that the social ontology of modernity is very much shaped by race. And you can see you know, Du Bois sort of taking up this theme decade after decade over his career, working out a social ontology of race. From the sort of original 1897 essay, The Conservation of Races, where it's somewhat ambiguous, and there's both sort of social construction and biological factors. And then his later famous aphorism, a black man is a person sort of forced to read Jim Crow, and his sort of more sort of constructors analysis. But the crucial point being that we need to recognize races as crucial constituents of the social ontology of the modern world, which then means that we also need to take into account how this group membership shapes us from a psychological point of view and how it constitutes an obstacle historically to whites signing on to a, a racial um, justice agenda. And then his second point, um, sort of coming out of that, is that the social ontology is not merely an ontology of differential positioning from a material point of view, as you find in Marxism, where of course the Marxist critique is that you need to recognize the class ontology and that the white working class even though they're nominally equal in terms of morality and the legal system, they're materially subordinated you know, by you know, the forces of, of, um, of, the, of the class order. And the Du Boisian critique, the Afro-modern critique, is, I'm suggesting, a deeper critique than that. Because the Afro-modern critique is saying, not merely is it the case that blacks and other people of color are materially subordinated, but that they have a lower moral status. So Marx emphasized the white working class are normatively equal. How then are they exploited? Well, of course, volume one of Capital is you know, trying to explain that, that you can have exploitation even though you have a seemingly um, exchange of equals. The crucial point of Du Bois and the black radical tradition is that people of color are not normatively equal in the first place. So in terms of social recognition, in terms of how they're sort of seen in the society, they represent a morally degraded group. And the point then is that the narrative of modernity that we tell, that maybe we tell our students when we're being careless and sloppy, that modernity brings into existence the equalization of the population by comparison with sort of pre-modern inequalities of the ancient world and the medieval world, that narrative is radically false. It really only works for white men. White women do not become equal, and people of color do not e become equal. And what that means, if you think about it, the majority of the population are unequal in liberal modernity. And it then means that any serious attempt to sort of bring it to realization, liberal ideals, is going to have to take this inequality into account. OK, I also argue that in Du Bois, you also find a concept of exploitation that's different from the Marxist concept that does not rely on the labor theory of value, which, as you know, has become a very contested and that um, most Marxists, in fact, you know, have stopped um, um, you know, endorsing it. And of course, it was, was, was dismissed in mainstream economic theory from way back in the 19th century. But that you can make a case within a liberal framework for racial exploitation that does not rely on such dubious Marxist assumptions. You can just use the respectable liberal concept of unjust enrichment. And once you do that, and once you sort of you know, broaden the scope of your theoretical lenses, you can then see that racial exploitation has been central to Western modernity from the start. Not merely the obvious cases of chattel slavery and colonial forced labor and indigenous, oh my god, two minutes, uh, expropriation, but continuing exploitation in terms of you know, the ghetto and the fact that you know, people don't you know, get an equal education don't get a chance to sort of find out where the jobs are, et cetera, et cetera. So that huge body of work, which mainstream philosophers have utterly ignored, which you can find in sociology in terms of the gap in wealth between white and black households, and how it's getting larger rather than small, all of that 
then needs to be seen. This is what a racialized liberal polity, a white supremacist polity, this is what it rests on. So what we're calling white privilege, focus tends to be on you know, things that are sort of less significant in terms of everyday interaction and so forth. There's a huge material basis for it in terms of racial exploitation. And then finally, Du Bois also argues that one of the manifestations of a racial polity will be the violation of the liberal norm of transparency. Because you cannot admit, if you're basically adhering to nominally liberal democratic norms, you cannot admit that the polity is based on the systemic subordination and exploitation of this population of color. So you are then going to have a set of norms, a set of overarching concepts, a set of practices in which what is entrenched is going to be social opacity. So the central liberal value of social transparency is going to be systematically violated. And this has been, of course, a central theme of the Africana tradition in terms of trying to expose to the public view what the real conditions of the polity are. And in, our, in, in our Du Bois's numerous works, in, our, there are book he, sorry, in the book that uh, my former colleague Aldon Morris, in sociology that Northwestern did, in terms of pointing that Du Bois is the real father of you know, American sociology, and this huge body of work, what you're trying to do is sort of bring into the public sphere the reality that the society is a racialized one. So I'll stop there, but the idea is this is how you can sort of bring the Afro-modern um, critique into liberal theory, you sort of take these norms, and then show how they are systematically violated. So a black liberalism needs to sort of start from that point and then say, how can we realize them once you take the actuality into account? Thank you. And now Chip Turner. Chip's uh, paper is called, uh, let's see, African American Individualism from the Heroic to the Relational. Okay. Is it on? Okay, my voice is pretty tend to project, so um, I think we'll be all right. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Julia and Melvin for having me here. It's a real honor to be in this room with so many scholars who I've read and admired for a long time. Um, I especially want to acknowledge what a thrill it is for me to be on a panel uh, with Charles Mills and Sharon Krause. Uh, I was reading them in graduate school with great admiration. And These are not things one wants to hear. <laughs> Just say vaguely, I was reading them some years ago. <laughs> uh, and um, to be, on a, to, to be on, on a panel with them is, is uh, something of a dream come true. So Melvin, could you take a picture of me with, with Charles and Sharon? Because I think my career goes downhill from here. Um, so the question before this panel is, can advocates of black liberation and racial justice occupy liberalism? My answer will be a partial yes, but it's a partial nature of this yes that will prove most interesting. The basis of this answer will be an analysis of what I am calling African American individualism, a tradition of ethical and moral individualism extending from Frederick Douglass to Ralph Ellison to James Baldwin, a tradition specifically addressed to the struggle for racial justice in the United States. Over time, this tradition moved from being liberal to post-liberal. And that I should have said uh, from Frederick Douglass, Ralph Ellison, and James Baldwin to Audre Lorde. Uh, over time, this tradition moved from being liberal to post-liberal. Baldwin and Lorde especially turned the energy behind liberal commitments to life and liberty against a liberal commitment to property. And in so doing, they moved the spirit of liberalism into a more democratic socialist direction. Though based on previous work, my paper today extends and revises that work in substantial ways. Let me begin by summarizing the previous work and then turn to the extensions, the revisions, and their implications. In 2012, I published a book entitled Awakening a Race, Individualism and Social Consciousness in America. That book argued that there are two main traditions of individualism in the United States, an atomistic tradition and a democratic tradition. The atomistic tradition insists that success in life is mostly the result of individual exertion. It opposes mass collective action and government interference in the market. This is a privatized individualism criticized by Tocqueville in Democracy in America, the laissez-faire individualism espoused by conservatives ranging from William Graham Sumner to Ronald Reagan.
the individualism that underwrote William Bennett's statement on election night 2008 that after the election of the first black president, there are no more excuses. This is the individualism that says that racial inequality is a result of unequal exertion and that the solution to that inequality is not social and economic reconstruction, but rather black and brown Americans pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. The second tradition is democratic individualism. As opposed to atomistic individualism, democratic individualism is keenly sensitive to the social preconditions of its own realization. Political theorists George Kateb and Nancy Rosenblum identified its presence in the work of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And in Awakening to Race, I extend their account by focusing more intensely on the relationship between Emerson's and Thoreau's theories of individuality and their contributions to the anti-slavery movement. Furthermore, I examine the individuals of three major African-American political thinkers, Frederick Douglass, Ralph Ellison, and James Baldwin. On the basis of the historical and textual analysis, I conclude that democratic individualism entails two civic obligations that both resist racial injustice. The first is a non-exploitation obligation requiring that democratic individuals ensure that their pursuit of self-reliance does not directly or indirectly abridge that of others. On the basis of this uh, obligation, Emerson and Thoreau determined that they are bound by self-reliance to contribute to the anti-slavery struggle. The second is a democratic egalitarian obligation requiring democratic individuals to help ensure that all of society's members have self-reliance's material prerequisites. On the basis of this principle, Frederick Douglass concluded after the Civil War that the federal government was obligated to provide educational and economic assistance to freed slaves, though for a variety of reasons, Douglass' support for this principle came slowly, and even when it came, it was far too inhibited. In addition, Awakening the Race claimed that within the democratic individual's tradition, there was a distinct African-American configuration, one distinguishable from both atomistic individualism and white democratic individualism of Emerson and Thoreau. Based on my reading of Douglas Ellison and Baldwin, African-American individualism or uh, African-American democratic individualism or African-American individualism for short, had four distinguishing characteristics. First was socioeconomic realism, that sensitivity to the social material prerequisites of self-development, a belief in a communal obligation to guarantee them. The second was sensitivity to dialectics of identity and difference, deep awareness of the ways personal identities are forged through articulations of difference and the dangers of converting difference into otherness. The third is historical consciousness, emphasis on the ways that historical self-understanding is a precondition of both self-awareness and effective action. And fourth, appreciation of relinquishment as a virtuous act, a belief that giving up unjustifiable advantage is not only a moral duty, but also a personal excellence, one that performs commitments to the universalization of democratic individualist capacities. For the most part, I am still committed to the argument of awakening to race. At the same time, there are elements of it that dissatisfied me even at the time of publication and my dissatisfaction has only grown since then. I won't enumerate all these points of dissatisfaction. Instead, I'll focus on perhaps the most major, the all-male cast of characters. The all-male cast have been pointed out to me several times since I wrote the book. I resisted the inference made by many that this implied that democratic individualism was intrinsically masculinist. Though it struck me that a variety, a variety of feminist intellectuals from Elizabeth Cady Stanton Polly Murray to Audre Lorde, expressed democratic individual sensibilities and ideals. The tenure clock did not allow me to spend one to two more years researching and writing a chapter on one of these figures. I threw in a towel, wrote an apologetic endnote, and published the book as is. Yet I came away from the process determined to make good on a claim that there could be a feminist democratic individualism. I spent the next several years writing the chapter on Audre Lorde that I wish I could have included in Awakening the Race. It turns out I was right. There's no way I could have completed the chapter by the end of my tenure clock. It took three years of research, writing, and rewriting, including a week in Audre Lorde's papers at Spelman to produce an account of Lorde I could stand behind. This chapter is now forthcoming in the African American Political Thought and Collective History Anthology that Melvin and I are editing and submitting this month to the University of Chicago Press. <laughs> 
In the course of doing this research, I discovered that the only responsible way to approach a question of individuality in Lord was through a comprehensive analysis of the key word difference in our political thought. Difference is Lord's conceptual lodestar, and she uses the word in four distinct senses. First, difference is a pretext for division and domination. Second, difference is differentiation in group experience and perspective. Third, difference is a site of personal and political growth. And fourth, difference is a marker of individuality. So I'm going to spend some time talking about the fourth sense of difference, but I really want to emphasize that my analysis of the fourth sense of difference is nested within my analysis of the first three senses of difference. If you'd like me to talk about the first three senses of difference, I'm happy to do so within the Q&A. The fourth sense of difference appears in several texts where Lord emphasizes the need for political and social movements to respect members' individuality. You do not have to be me in order us to fight alongside each other, Lord reflects in learning from the 60s. I do not have to be you to recognize that our wars are the same. What we must do is commit ourselves to some future that can include each other and to work toward that future with the particular strengths of our individual identities. And in order to do this, we must allow each other our differences at the same time as we recognize our sameness. Difference in the final sentence refers unmistakably to individual level of variety. Distinctions between individuals, Lord argues, are ethically salient and require careful attention and acknowledgement. Lord frames individuality not as an obstacle to coalition, but rather as a source of creative power. She calls on her audience to commit themselves to a shared future of egalitarian inclusiveness that treats the plurality of individual identities as a political resource. Lord's fourth sense of difference also comes through in an on-camera interview in a documentary film, Litany for Survival, The Life and Work of Audre Lorde. One of the lessons that I think the 60s need to teach us is that liberation is not the private province of, of any one particular group. We are individuals, we are particular people, and we have differences that we can use that we need to recognize, identify, and use in our common goals, in our common struggles. On the one hand, the primary subject of the statement is liberation, which we should understand as a coalitional project among multiple overlapping groups, women, black people, gays and lesbians, the poor, the ill, the disabled. In this respect, the sta statement's emphasis is trans-individual. On the other hand, Lord's language of individuals and particular people is emphatic. So when Lord says we have differences we can use, we may confidently infer that she means not only differences between identity groups, but also differences between individuals. The two, in fact, are mutually constitutive. The one way identity groups emerge is when individuals <coughs> who share a common oppression come together, communicate about that oppression, and forge a language expressing their identity as an oppressed group. In an address entitled Survival, delivered at a Black Writers Conference at Howard University in 1976, Lord defined peoplehood in these individualistic terms. She said, quote, a people is a group of individuals who share some part of their mutual self-definition, end quote. Individuals, of course, draw on inherited traditions and surrounding cultures to forge new articulations of group identity. But though these new articulations are indebted to the old, they still reflect the agency of the individuals who transform, who transform the old into the new. So analyzing and identifying Lord's individualism augmented my argument in Waking on a Race that there is an authentically democratic tradition of individualism in American and African American thought. At the same time, identifying that individualism forced me to re revise my previous conception of democratic individualism in important and even surprising ways. What is most striking about Lord's defenses of individuality is that they preponderantly occur in our discussions of the ethics and politics of coalition. It is a commonplace that Lord never fit comfortably into any of the social movements in which she participated. She was too womanish for the civil rights movement, too black for second wave feminism and gay rights, too old for the Kambahi River Collective. She embodied the problem of intersection, uh, intersectional isolation before intersectionality was even a word. She used a large repertoire of rhetorical weapons to combat this isolation, but one of these was individualist discourse. 
Employing that discourse to carve out space for nonconformity within identity-based social movements, she brought in the sharp relief the relational dependencies that attend the struggle for not just individuality, but integrity and survival. Coming to terms with the way that Lord's relational individualism exceeded my previous conception of democratic individualism also dovetailed with a criticism of my interpretation of Baldwin offered by black feminist pragmatist and critical race theorist Denise James at a 2013 roundtable on Awakening to Race at the annual meeting of the Eastern Division of the American Political Philosophical Association. Though generally favorable toward the book, James argued that Baldwin's emphasis on a relationality bursts a frame of democratic individualism. So, quote, this is uh, Denise James, the relationship of self to others in Baldwin has a level of importance I am not convinced Turner's democratic individualism can permit. Baldwin's work forms a, uh, a signals a form of humanism that centers relational life at the core of human fulfillment, end quote. Reflecting on Lord's distinctive individualism, uh, together with James' criticism of my reading of Baldwin, it occurred to me that African-American individual's tradition contained two different strands, a heroic individualist strand and a relational individualist strand. It'd be tempting to say that Douglas and Ellison represent a heroic and that Baldwin and Lord represent their relational, but that would be an oversimplification. Though predominantly heroic individualists, Douglas and Ellison have relational moments. And though predominantly relational individualists, Baldwin and Lord have heroic moments. All four thinkers contain mixtures of the heroic and the relational, though in different ratios. So roughly, if we could say that Douglas is six parts heroic and two parts relational, and Ellison five parts heroic and three parts relational, then Baldwin's five parts relational and three parts heroic, yes. and Lord six parts relational, two parts heroic. I, that's a vast oversimplification, but I, I want to just give you the general idea. No ethical commitments can't be, of course, quantified. It's still helpful to think of the heroic and relational strains of African-American individualism as inversely related. And so, you know, if you were to try, this is the first time I've ever used a graph, but um, in this instant, it seemed appropriate just so it could demonstrate uh, or show the inverse relation between the heroic and the relational elements. And one thing I think it's also interesting about this is it helps us sort of see the way in which um, individualism within the African-American tradition moves from a liberal configuration in Douglas and Ellison to a post-liberal configuration in Baldwin and Lord. So the question is, does the textual evidence um, bear out this new conceptualization of Af African-American individualism as a two-stranded tradition? And in the paper, I offer a brief comparison of uh, some passages from Douglas to Lord in order to show that uh, it, the textual evidence does largely, although it's going to require a much longer paper for me to fully bear out that claim. Um, and so one of the things I do in the paper is I analyze a few passages from Douglas that I analyze in Awakening, Awakening to Race, but one of the things that comes in a clearer view through this prism is the liberal capitalist aesthetics of Douglas's configuration of self-making as making productive value. And then um, I then contrast it with Lord's essay, Manchild, a Black Lesbian's uh, Feminist Response, which is discussing about her relationship with her son, Jonathan, and the way in which Jonathan's self-formation, how it comes into focus through opposition, um, through a productive opposition to her own maternal practices. And so it focuses on sort of the relational setting of individual self-formation. So I'm going to conclude with the so what question. Even if there is an African-American individualist tradition, and even if it is comprised of competing heroic and relational strands, why is this politically interesting? First, identifying African-American individualism as a two-stranded tradition interweaving the heroic and the relational helps clarify that tradition's vexed relationship to liberalism. Though Douglas and well Ellison are widely and justifiably seen as liberal thinkers, Baldwin and Lord are widely and justifiably seen as critics or even enemies of liberalism. It may be that the different ratios of the heroic and the relational in their thought helps explain why the first two are unmistakably liberal and the latter two post-liberal. It may be that the different ratios generate different orientations toward property rights as well as toward the spirit of possessiveness and exchange relations that property rights generate. Douglas was a fervent defender of the natural right to property, 
Ellison was a Cold War liberal who accepted both provisions for and the limits on property set by Roosevelt's New Deal and Johnson's Great Society. Baldwin is a critic of property not just as an economic institution, but as a form of political relationship. He attacked the legally, violently enforced exclusion at the conceptual heart of property, writing that freedom is not a matter of keeping everyone else out of your backyard, end quote. Lord was an ambivalent Marxist who, though she valued hard work as a sign of virtue, endorsed revolutionary socialist politics. If the holy triumvirate of liberalism is life, liberty, and property, Douglas, Ellison, and Baldwin are united in life and liberty, but divided on property. Could it be that there are elective affinities between heroic figurations of the self and liberal property relations on the one hand, and between relational figurations of the self and democratic socialism on the other? Second, clarifying the existence of relational individualist tradition may help answer a question that has long vexed democratic individualism. What are democratic individualist politics? It has been held by many that democratic individualism may be fine as ethics, but that it is insufficient for articulating a politics adequate to the problems of late modern democracy, largely because it is so inhibited about mass democratic action and political solidarity. Lord provides democratic individualism a way out of this impasse. Whereas Emerson, Thoreau, Ellison, and Baldwin all practice literary forms of citizenship and engage in various forms of consciousness raising and public exemplarity, none forthrightly answered the question of what a positive mass democratic politics looks like. Lord, however, does in her essay, Learning from the 60s. She writes, militancy no longer means guns at high noon, if it ever did. It means actively working for change, sometimes in the absence of any surety that change is coming. It means doing the unromantic and tedious work necessary to forge meaningful coalitions. It means recognizing which coalitions are possible and which are not. It means knowing that coalition, like you did, means the coming together of whole, self-actualized human beings, focused and believing, not fragmented automatons marching to a prescribed step. The mass politics of individuality is a politics of coalition forging political solidarity across individual and group differences, but doing so in ways respectful of the autonomy of individual members. Lord's ethics and politics of coalition provides a bridge between claims of individuality and the demands of mass democratic politics. Finally, African-American individualism offers a window into both the virtues and the limits of liberalism itself. Douglas, Ellison, Baldwin, and Lord are all committed to ideals of self-development and nonconformity central to the liberal tradition. Yet they part ways on questions of property, as well as on questions of what is necessary to form a free self. As we move from the heroic to the relational in African American thought, love and care take on increasing political significance. It may be that the balance of the heroic and the relational elements in Douglass's, Ellison's, Baldwin's, and Lord's respective individualisms play a decisive role in ori orienting them toward property, care, and love and that decides whether they are liberal or something more radical, something post-liberal. In so far as Baldwin and Lord, however, are models the more radical, more relational, more socialist politics that Americans need, we must at the same time observe how much this politics is still grounded in the traditional liberal commitment to freedom and equal dignity of individual selves. Post-liberal, relationally individualist politics only achieved its identity by occupying liberalism. The question is, where does the occupation go from here? How will it take liberalism further beyond itself? Thank you.